Thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, obviously, you just wrapped up your first session, mm -hmm. historic session. I'm not in terms, just in terms of length, <laughs> in terms of vetoes. Um, you set records with that. I want to just start this conversation with what was the biggest takeaway from this year, this first first half a year as being governor. What's the biggest takeaway? Well, despite the length of the session, the number of vetoes, I think we had some big wins for Arizonans and. What that shows is that if we can put our partisan differences aside, we can get things done for Arizonans. I think that's what Arizonans elected all of us to do. And uh, we're going to continue to build on those successes. So what do you, when you look back, at what was, do you think the biggest success was so far this year? Was it uh, the, the, the budget deal that you passed? I know you guys you were bragging about how it was bipartisan mm -hmm. and whatnot. What was, was it that was something else? Well, I certainly um, would, would put the budget at the top of the list. Um, it was a bipartisan budget that got out of both chambers with super majorities and had some really big wins for Arizonans. Uh, when you look at housing and our investment in affordable housing and homelessness, um, the investment in infrastructure across the state, um, those are huge things for us and um, but this prop 400 deal that we just were able to get done this week um, is also uh, really important it was a huge priority going into session and um, we got it done and we're gonna get into that in just a second mm -hmm. but uh, you know I want you to be kind of self-critical at this point if you can uh, biggest mistakes that you made coming in your new governor um, obviously it's a big big job there's no really preparing for it biggest mistake you think you made that you learned from? Well, I certainly, um, we're in the process of building out our legislative team, um, need to have more folks on the ground there. I think that was one of the biggest issues. And so we're certainly taking everything um, and, and learning from it and building on it so that we can do better next session. I was, I mean, do you think there's something like, uh, you got criticized a lot for the so-called the tamale bill, mm -hmm. home cook, cook uh, food bill. Yeah. What would you do different about that today? Because there was a lot of criticism, like why would the governor even allow this bill to come to her? That she should have known mm -hmm. that if she'd vetoed this, it was going to upset her own party. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that was a, a, an, a, an example of where we needed more folks on the ground uh, and engaging earlier in the process. And we're, we're we're going to do that next time, and we're and we're already working on we're working with stakeholders on that particular issue to see if we can come to some agreement and get something through next session. All right, let's uh, get to, uh, down to the recent news. Then you brought up Proposition 400. Um, this is the ability. This is the legislature putting this question to the voters in Maricopa County next year. Half cent sales tax estimated raise about a billion dollars a year for the next 20 years. Uh, uh, did you give up too much? I mean, there's been some reporting out there that, you know, Republicans got, you know, uh, the, the, you know that uh, Republic, what they got was fewer regulations on, you know, car, on electric cars. Uh, you know, there's money in there that you can't be used for bike lanes on this. Um, do you feel like you, got, you gave up too much to get this issue onto the ballot? No, I think at the end of the day, we were able to come to an agreement that all parties uh, were okay with. And, um, you know, it's a compromise. It's compromise legislation. Um, there's always going to be concessions. Um, there were concessions on the other side in terms of the number, uh, the percentage that's going to transit that we had to push to get where it needed to be. Um, and you know, I think a lot of the um, the the wins that the conservatives are touting are to push back on the far right who call this a giveaway to the Democrats. It's not. It is something that's a win for all Arizonans and important for continued economic growth, not just in the region, but the state. And what do you think about the, this? It's like a, it's an, almost like an anomaly that Maricopa County is the only county mm -hmm in the state that needs the legislator, legisl legislature's approval yeah. to put a question to the voters to tax itself. Mm -hmm. Is this something that can be that, that you agree with? Is something you'd like to see change moving forward? Uh, it's certainly something that handicaps the voters of Maricopa County. I mean, this is, it was a huge lift to get it done last year and the governor at the time decided to veto it. Um, it was an even bigger lift this year. Um, the voters of Maricopa County should just be able to decide and they will now, but it was a lot of headache and heartache to get there. Uh, so yeah, this will, this is something we should address. Should there have been more money for light rail? Are you a fan of light rail? Uh, I'm a fan of light rail. I think um, we're sitting in a business that is the beneficiary of having being right on the light rail um, and having that customer base come in. Um, it's good for the economy. It's good for 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 all Arizonans. And um, 
I think that the way that the language was structured, um, the cities will be able to find another way to continue to expand light rail. Why not fight a little bit harder than to get the extension? I mean, oh. light rail is not going to go away right. with this money, but there's no new money to expand it. Um, and it's far less money than was previously offered. I mean, there was a bill last year, I think 14% of the revenues, um, you know, I have to double check my math on that, but I believe it was around 14% of revenues from this could go toward light rail. That's been curtailed drastically from uh, in, in this deal. Why not fight a little bit harder for well, that? Obviously, there was a lot of moving parts, a lot of ongoing discussion for days about um, where we could give, where we couldn't give. And at the end of the day, all of the stakeholders uh, were, were good with what came out of um, the final result. And so um, these were concessions that they were able to make. Okay, let's, and let's talk then. You know, you know, you know I'm going to ask about the rental tax. Yeah. Um, there was a bill, similar bill, very similar bill, almost identical bill, uh, that you vetoed earlier uh, this session. This was the tax on, that's imposed on, on renters. It's anywhere, I think, from 1% to 4% or something like that. You vetoed it because I think at the time you called it a tax cut for landlords. Mm -hmm. But you agreed to sign it this, this time. It looks like it was part of that deal to get Prop 400 to the, to the, to the ballot. What changed? Was it just you know, raw politics that you knew that to get this Prop 400 to the ballot, you had to sign this bill that you didn't like? I mean, again, this was a compromise and there were changes made um, that made it um, more agreeable. Uh, we are gonna work closely to ensure that those savings are indeed being passed on to renters and work with the local jurisdictions in terms of mitigating the, the revenue hit. But how do you make sure those savings are passed on to renters? Or members of your own party still very skeptical of that at this point. And I believe the, the bill, the intent of the bill is those savings to be passed on to renters, but yes. what's the enforcement mechanism in that? Uh, well, I guess we'll see when it goes into place uh, next January, or 25, but um, but no, I mean, it's something that we'll have to monitor. And I believe it's something, if they can complain, if a renter complains about it, it's the burden of proof is on the landlord to show they passed on those savings. I guess I'm kind of, uh, yeah, be other people skeptical, if somebody is, you know, counting on saving 20 bucks a month or whatever it, it turns out to be, do you really think they have the time, the resources to fight for this, you know, rental tax, uh, you know, uh, in court or any other legal measure? Do you think somebody's got the time and the resources to do that? Uh, well, we'll make sure that we're, we're going to make, we're going to make sure the savings get passed on. It, it, can you be more specific though? Um, I mean, what does that mean, make sure? I mean, how do you monitor this? A lot of people run. No, there are, and there's, um, there's resources right now for enforcing landlord-tenant um, laws, and this, will, this is another piece of that. Okay. Um, I want to stick with housing. You brought up the money that went into the, the housing trust, um, you know, celebrated by a lot of people at the time. I want to talk to you a little bit more about what was done. I didn't see much was done. Uh, you know, to help people in Arizona afford their home? Because I believe in your state of the state, you talked about the American dream is getting farther away from Arizonans. Part of that is owning a home. Um, and I know we have to address affordable housing and people who are experiencing homelessness or nearing that point. But what about people who aren't, but still they're kind of in that middle where they're not, you know, you know, in threat of losing their living on the streets, mm -hmm. but there's no way that they can save to save for a home here in Arizona because, as you well know, I mean, the price of homes have skyrocketed yeah. over the past several years. What can you do about that? Yeah, I mean, this is a long term issue that we're not going to solve overnight. Um, certainly, there are um, longer term solutions that we can look at putting on the table. Um, this was what we were able to do this year. It's certainly not the end of what we're going to do to make housing more affordable in Arizona. It is one. Do you think it's a supply side problem, demand? Or what, what do you think the big problem is? And when you, because I mean, you're obviously, you just wrapped up this session. You always got to have an eye to the future. I mean, what's the, what's the next big thing you have to address in terms of housing? Yeah, I mean, supply is certainly an issue. There were some um, regulatory reforms moving through that at the end of the day didn't have the votes to, to pass. So those are things we can look at. Um, I think there's a lot of impetus to get that done. Um, and we're, we're in the middle of, of 
figuring out our legislative agenda for next year. So um, certainly uh, all of those things are on the table. Yeah, I mean, this is something too, I mean, we know we've done some reporting um, at our station about certain corporations buying up a lot of the housing stock, short-term rentals and yeah. things like that. Is that something that can be attacked from the governor's office? Uh, it's something that we're looking at for sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, also, um, I do want to talk a little bit about the big issue the past month has been the heat. We just broke a dubious streak of record heat of temperatures over 110 degrees for, I believe, for 31 straight days in a row. Um, do you think weather events like this are public health emergencies? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're seeing, um, we're going to continue to see hotter summers in Arizona. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is something that if, there, if it was declared as an emergency, there would be more resources to help address. Yeah, and you issued some executive orders uh, directing ADOS to be making sure that, you know, that uh, workers are working in safe environments, getting water breaks and things like that. Is there a stronger role for the state government? I know that, you know, Ruben Gallego, um, other Democrats in Congress have called on FEMA to recognize mm -hmm. this extreme weather as like a, a, another weather event like a hurricane or a t tornado or something like that. Uh, but they're not recognizing heat at this point. So I ask you, I mean, as the governor, do you think the state could play a longer role? Because what we're seeing here, at least in Maricopa County, and again, it's hot everywhere else, um, you know, we're seeing cooling centers that are closing at five o'clock in the afternoon, six o'clock in the afternoon. We're only seeing the, the, the lows getting down to, I think one day it was 97. Could the state play a stronger role in releasing money, declaring an emergency, getting more state assets involved to, to help people get through times like this? Yeah, I mean, we're certainly looking at, at those options. Um, we're looking at how we can be more supportive of the regional heat uh, cooling efforts um, that are now a regular part of what we do in the summer. Um, and the state could certainly be a better partner there. So, um, so we're looking at um, ways all the ways, all the things you listed um, that would be tools to help address this. I was going to say, was there, has there been conversations about maybe the state declaring, you declare issuing an emergency out there and get more of those assets out onto the streets to help these folks get through these times? Um, it is something that we've talked about, yes. All right. Um, we are just moving right along here. Um, I want to get to the issue of uh, ESAs. Uh, when you released your budget um, earlier in the year, it seems like 10 years ago now, but earlier this year, you released your budget, and part of that was um, you were going to save the state $1.5 billion over 10 years by repealing the ESA program. We now seen those cost estimates balloon. Um, your numbers show it at over $1 billion a year for the school voucher program. The State Department of Education's numbers show it over a billion, um, yet nothing was done this year uh, to curtail the growth of that program. Is that a failure on your part? Um, I would point that right back to the legislative Republicans who refused to put it on the table. Um, it, it's not that we didn't fight for some sort of repeal, some sort of guardrails. Um, it was clear that that was a non-starter for them. And so we, um, we fought to get some measures in place that will help track the data to show how out of control the program is. We have numbers now that continue to validate um, that it is a much bigger strain on the budget than was initially promised. And we're going to continue to push those numbers. Um, this is not a, a done deal for sure. And you're still fighting for some of the, uh, you know, more transparent, uh, more transparency on this. Talked a little bit about what you'd like to see there with that, because uh, I, I believe you recently put out something. You're talking about, uh, you know, parents having more access to information to these public schools that take private, uh, that take, or private schools that take public money. Oh, for sure. I mean, um, there's a lot of talk all the time about requiring. Um, things of the entities that get the funds that the, I think the biggest issue there is is how to streamline that because right now the funds go to the families um, and there's no um, uh, streamlined reporting of how those funds are spent so I think that'd be uh, an important start um, and I think you know something that should be on the table is means testing these um, right now, um, our working families are um, subsidizing private schools with, with these vouchers. All right. Um, already starting to run out of time here. There's never enough time. Um, I'm already getting the signal here. Mm -hmm. But um, I do want to ask uh, another big issue recently. Um, you know, uh, 
the 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 alfalfa farming in Arizona is uh, is backed by, for, by 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 the Saudi government. Um, there's been some talk, you know, about what a role that you could play. Mm -hmm. Some of the, one of at least one of those leases for that is coming up here, I believe, within six months. Mm -hmm. Is this something you're going to look at? Are you going to renew those leases? Is that something you're considering, or do you want them out of, out of this business? Um, we're absolutely considering um, uh, whether or not to renew that lease, and we started right away looking at all of the leases on state land um, and the water use and. Um, what's in the best interest of the state in terms of those leases and uh, ways that we can ensure that those leases are going to folks that are um, using water well uh, and that it's benefiting Arizonans. Um, this is you know, probably the most egregious, egregious example of where that may not be the case. And so um, if it was as easy as just yanking the lease, that could have been done, but there's, you know, le leases are legal agreements and there's all kinds of um, issues there. So we're, we're certainly looking at what the best options are for Arizonans in that situation. Right, um, final question here, if that's okay with uh, final question here. Um, congratulations, you got your DPS director confirmed yes. in the Senate, but overall it's only six of your picks to run state agencies have gotten through this year. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you see this affecting the running of, of Arizona governance here. Well, our directors are, are fully functioning. Um, we're making sure that they have the support from our administration to do the jobs they were tasked with doing, um, regardless of confirmation or not. And we're gonna continue to um, provide that support, make sure that government is functioning and, um, and work through the uh, unprecedented process that the Senate has put in place. <laughs> and you've heard the criticism uh, from your party. Maybe you should have worked a little bit harder before signing the budget. You could have used the budget as a negotiating leverage to get some more of your picks done, or at least a hearing, because, I mean, they have, they've been moving very slowly on this. What do you say to them? Coulda, shoulda, woulda. I mean, we're here. This is where we are. We're, we're, um, we're moving forward. All right. Well, thank you very much, Governor. Thank you.